Hello, I am Leopoldo Ernesto and in this presentation I will talk about different types of range sensors, that is, sensors that measure distances frequently used in mobile robots. Specifically, in this presentation I will explain the principle of, of the operation of three types of sensors. We will start with the infrared sensor and analyze the principle of operation based on three different uh, sensor configurations. Afterwards, I will explain the principle of operation of ultrasound sensors and we will see the type of signal received and the difficulties that we will face with this type of sensor to generate a precise map. Finally, we will see the principle of operation of LiDAR sensors or laser range finder, LRF and we will also see some examples of images uh, obtained from these sensors uh, that uh, will help you to understand the quality of the measurement. Well, infrared sensors, such as the SHARP sensor that you see here in this uh, picture, uh, has been used uh, uh, by many robots, but they are, in my opinion, increasingly uh, being out of use because of new technologies with better features have recently emerged. The operating principle consists of an LED that emits an infrared light that bounces off on an object and part of this light is returned in the direction of the sensor that passes through a lens that is detected by a, a linear photodetector. Uh, the way to measure the, uh, its, uh, to compute the distance is basically based on the angle or the position of the ray that is detected. You can see here uh, the calculi we can use for this, um, this distance uh, computation and we can see that it's inversely proportional to the detected position which makes the sensor response clearly non-linear as you can see also in the characteristic curve of the sensor. Um, of course this can be corrected by approximating the curve and this is what for example the Arduino Sharp IR uh, library uh, does and that has experimentally established this curve uh, or, the, or this expression you can see and, uh, and in the end uh, we can use it up to uh, usually between 50 centimeters or 80 centimeters maximum because from those distances and above the sensitivity is very small and the, the signal uh, noise ratio is compromised. Then we have uh, a new type of uh, infrared sensors uh, that are based on a laser sensor indeed uh, that it has an emitter, a laser emitter, which is emitting in a spectrum of light of 914 nanometers and the sensor also has an, a spot diode, this is an avalanche or it's a, di a diode, a photodiode that is working on the avalanche zone of the, of the diode and the sensor uh, approximately has uh, 25 degrees of detection angular aperture and can detect objects up to uh, 2 meters um, uh, if, if it's the case of the VL53L0 version but other models can, to, can detect up to 4 meters and also uh, it's worth mentioning that the color affects the sensor ability to detect particularly with dark colors offering a worse uh, characteristic because they absorb more light and it also affects whether you use these sensors indoors or outdoors because sunlight also affects to the ability of these sensors. Um, the sensor has different uh, operating modes whether we want to have a greater precision or a, a larger distance or if you want to have a, a better response time and uh, the way we measure the, the distance uh, using these sensors is with a technique which is called time of flight which basically, basically measures the time that the, the laser ray takes to, from, uh, to depart from the emitter and, and it's been received, uh, received by the sensor and obviously we need for that a very accurate sensor like the SPAT uh, sensor that for instance one centimeter basically with the, the speed of the light basically uh, represents uh, 67 picoseconds of difference. And then we have uh, this sensor, it's the TCRT5000. It's a well-known sensor as well and it can be used in order to, re to detect the amount of light uh, with a phototransistor in this case. 
that has been generated with an infrared LED. Uh, the sensor is affected by the sunlight as well, and um, even some uh, light in the room can affect to our measurements, so it's usually a good uh, procedure to calibrate the amount of light we are uh, detecting with this sensor for a specific object. And in particular, in robotics, we use them as line tracking sensors because the color affects the measurements, so we can detect or distinguish between dark and white uh, uh, objects, like we use for line tracking. Uh, but also to prevent uh, a robot from falling uh, on a table. I would not recommend it for a sensor to detect distances, but although you can see here an example of a robot that uh, used uh, those sensors uh, up to a distance of 10 centimeters, is a very small distance. Then we have ultrasound sensors uh, that are used by many robots indeed. And the principle, uh, the operating principle is based on uh, emitting sound waves that are generating from the excitation of a membrane that vibrates and generate these waves. And they travel through the air or water uh, and bounces off on objects like, uh, like light on a, on, a, on a mirror. And um, so it's a, a, a specular reflection. And uh, the, the waves are returned and captured by another membrane that generates an echo and the distance is again computed from the time of flight based on, in this case, the speed of sound. That depends on whether it's air or air, uh, water. Ultrasound sensors are used to generate maps and locate robots, uh, but uh, trying to mimic the, the ability of some animals like uh, bats or dolphins, but the, the, act, the fact is that the quality of these maps is relatively quite uh, it's poor because they have uh, some uh, problems that we will see. There are configurations that uh, use uh, a single sensor uh, a membrane that generates the, 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 the waves, then it's blocked using uh, some kind of internal blanking signal that blocks this uh, membrane and then it stops uh, the vibration and starts hearing for uh, the sounds to, to uh, bounce back. And, uh, and then we have a configuration with two membranes in which one of them is the one that emits and the other one is just simply the one that hears. And of course, the configuration with two membranes uh, allow us to detect distances even shorter than with one single membrane. Uh, due to their operating principle, ultrasound measurements are pres uh, they have a set of problems that we must take into account and know. Uh, the first of them is the angular uncertainty that basically implies that the membrane can receive echoes from several directions, different directions. We usually have some kind of main globe, uh, a range of uh, angle and aperture in which the sensor is clearly sensitive, uh, but we might have secondary lobes in which the sensor can receive echoes also from sides or from the sides of uh, angles. Um, the width of the main lobe is usually large. There are some of them that are narrow, but it's usually quite large. And that's why we use it to detect the object at a certain distance, but we don't know exactly with accuracy where the object is. Another problem that uh, affects the sensors are the specular reflections, because uh, they, um, they reflect, uh, as, as I said before, like the light uh, in a mirror. And it could happen that we're facing or pointing towards uh, an object, but we cannot hear the sound back. And uh, fortunately, some uh, objects are not perfect, and they have uh, this reflection. Uh, generate some some uh, some reflections also back to the object uh, to the sensors, but this cannot be generalized, of course. And also another important problem could be the crosstalking effect. Um, it's, a, it's a consequence of triggering different uh, waves or sounds and having multiple sensors hearing these sounds, it could happen that one of them uh, could detect the, um, the, 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 the waves or the sound from a different sensor and depending on the timing where they were triggered, we could think that the distance, uh, it's not, uh, the, the, uh, we, we may uh, fail in computing the distance because we are not uh, considering or we don't know exactly which, uh, what time was this uh, sound wave trigger. 
if it's not our own uh, sound, I mean. And so finally, uh, so basically uh, for that we, we propose several solutions. For the cross token effect, we, we can generate a, or, uh, a, a sequence of triggerings that at least will reduce part of this effect by sequencing uh, proper times where these uh, sound waves must be on the environment. And then in order to reduce the angular uncertainty, we can use uh, triangulation-based methods. From several measurements, we can infer where's, uh, where's the position of the object more accurately. And also, of course, we can uh, include or consider probabilistic models that might take into account all these uh, problems that these sensors have in order to, uh, let's say, uh, provide a probability for those kind of unexpected measurements. Uh, in marine, maritime uh, environments or marine environments, uh, uh, the, um, the sonar uh, behaves in a completely different way as in the air. And we use these sonars in order to build images uh, of, of the seabed. And uh, we can distinguish between two technologies, the size scan sonar, uh, that uh, basically, as its name suggests, it's using two transducers that point on the sides and generate a wide image that can be uh, built by dragging the sensor along a trajectory. And uh, these kind of sensors, they have an, a, an area which is known as the Nadir zone, where in which the sensor cannot detect because of the way they are built. And in general, with these kind of sensors, we can uh, uh, infer the height of objects with the shadows, but we only have one single scan uh, spread uh, on a wide direction, and uh, the height is not uh, necessarily uh, properly good estimated. On the other hand, we have multi-beam sonars that uh, they are used to point uh, at an area of the seabed, but not necessarily on the sides, and uh, they can be incorporated in autonomous underwater vehicles, and several beams are triggered, and by processing where they were triggered, and the phase, and the magnitude, and, and, and the angle they, 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 they have been triggered, and then we can get a precise image of the, um, of the uh, seabed. And it has no problems with the nadir zone uh, compared to the size scan sonar as before, and can work uh, on uneven terrains and also in uh, can detect the, the the height of objects. Then we have the leader sensor. It's a laser sensor that emits a pulse uh, light and also has a spot uh, diode. It's a photo detector uh, that detects the return of uh, uh, the light ray. And uh, it's based uh, also uh, on the time of flight, as we, we saw before. And uh, we can use it to measure, in this case, a 2D scan, or can be used in order to measure a 3D scan. And for that, we have different configurations with a motor rotating that uh, deviates the laser ray. Uh, the sensor can be considered precise and repetitive, uh, if we compare, for instance, with the ultrasound or infrared, of course. And um, it's slightly affected by reflective materials such as mirror or glasses. And in general, the color has little influence on the measurements, except very dark color materials. And uh, as I said, there are models like the lasers that, uh, uh, that rotates, uh, in this case, a mirror. But there are other models like the RP LiDAR that de rotate the entire hair in order to perform the scan. So in this case, the, uh, the, the laser and the photo detector are uh, rotating. Well, in this presentation, I have explained the working principle of uh, several uh, range sensors used in mobile robotics. Thank you very much.